Hi everyone, it's Kevin at Bear Creek. Uh, it's January 10th, 2020. Happy New Year. Uh, today what I really wanted to do was just a real quick video on uh, some things on a lot of people's minds as we get into winter. And that is uh, simply, you know, why did my bees die over the winter or late spring or, or whenever? Um, so it's, it's a it's a tough question to ask. Happens to everybody. So don't ever, uh, you know, uh, kick yourself too much um, on uh, losing hives. Everybody loses hives every year. It, it, it's it, very rare when you when you live in the environment that we do here. And I'm talking mostly to people that live in the Upper Midwest. Um, it's very hard to get all of your colonies through winter. The best thing you can do is try to limit the damage more than anything. Um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of entering my fifth year here as a beekeeper. Next spring, probably enter my fifth year, I'm gonna guess, I can't even remember anymore. Um, I've enjoyed my journey, but every year I keep trying new things to try to better myself as a beekeeper and that's why I pretty much don't do you know uh, how-to videos I, I try not to I'm trying not to teach people how to be a beekeeper I'm more interested in um, sharing with you what I do uh, my successes as well as my failures so don't don't ever think that I I am telling anybody how they need to keep their bees. I am a big proponent that all beekeeping is local. Uh, what I do here is not necessarily what somebody can do to succeed 40 miles from me or 100 miles from me. Um, and and really, um, I have I have a. Um, a beekeeping group and, and we have guys throughout the upper Midwest on it and some guys are uh, you know when it snows for them I mean it, it melts and you know by the next week uh, they can be in the upper 60s uh, we don't ever really get that here it might get into the 40s and we might start melting a little bit but when winter comes it's pretty much here uh, we've had a relatively mild winter started off uh, like a lion in uh, November when it was like uh, 15 below uh, for almost two weeks uh, but lately it's uh, it's been it's been fairly mild we haven't had a ton of snow uh, it's been getting you know into the 30s uh, quite often um, and the bees have actually been able to get out and have a few cleansing flights um, there's my, my colony, none of my colonies are ultra active, which is fantastic, but you know, uh, I don't know, when the sun is shining right on them, you can see this one here uh, coming out and uh, flying around and, and they'll come out and probably end up dying. But uh, like last year, I was having a real big issue with one of my colonies. Actually, it was in the position where the one on, the, on my far right here uh, was sitting a uh, big, huge, healthy colony, and even at 20 below, there were bees crawling out from it and dying. I'd see 50 bees out, out dead on the snow every single day, all winter long. I was out here at 20 below, and they'd be crawling out, and I'd see them fly off, and they'd just disappear, and you know those bees are dead. Um, and... You know, you question yourself, uh, you know, wow, that's really weird. What's going on? Why are they doing that? You know, but then you, you kind of you talk yourself into saying, well, you know, bees are going to die every single day. That's why they go into winter with, with large, healthy colonies. Uh, you know, they're just going to die due to, due to attrition. And that is that is the truth. And we'll get more into that scenario in a second. But um, some of the things that I've, uh, learned as I've been beekeeping as to the reasons why uh, my bees die throughout the winter. Um, number one, and this is, they're kind of in no particular order, but uh, um, not having a, a strong enough colony going into winter. 
Uh, if you don't have a strong enough colony going into winter, they probably aren't going to survive. Now, you know, down in Georgia, they could probably, you know, go, go through winter uh, in a two-frame nuke. Uh, it might get cold down to zero degrees on for two days, but they don't have to sustain that for any length of time. They're out, they can do cleansing flights, you can feed them, all those types of things, and they really don't need uh, a big cluster to survive. Up here, there is no way that a small cluster of bees is gonna survive the winter, uh, like our winters that we have, which are four or five, six months old. Uh, so having a very healthy population in the size of box that you uh, intend to winter them in is key. Now, you know, uh, a colony, you know, in a four frame nuke box that can fit a four frame nuke box uh, probably isn't good to overwinter in a 10 frame full, full length drop hive. Uh, just too much space for them to try to keep the core temperature up. Uh, so, you know, having a healthy uh, colony for the size uh, vessel that they're in is, is, is key. Um, number two is, uh, and this is very important, is getting control of the mites and disease before the bees create their winter nest. And by that, what I mean is if you have a extremely vibrant colony, but it's high in Varroa, and they're going, they're heading into fall, and they have, like I said, they have high Varroa content, those winter bees are also going to be affected by that. And those winter bees under the cappings are being attacked by the Varroa. And, you know, your bees are going to uh, have already lost some of their ways to defend viruses. Uh, so they're starting out uh, with a handicap, as it were. Um, you know, if you ever listen to Dr. Samuel Ram Ramsey's lectures, he, base, he essentially is saying that the, the Varroa is essentially sucking out the bee's liver. That's, that's what uh, uh, the um, fat body is. And the bees use that fat body to filter pathogens, as well as a whole host of other functions, along with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating fully functional um, other appendages, organs, and, and whatever on the bee. So uh, having healthy bees going into winter, a healthy colony, very low in Varroa, is a huge key into overwintering success. Uh, the third is they got to have food. And planning out... Uh, how much food to get on them at what time is also key. It's important for you to learn when your last real honey flow is. And if you do have a normal honey flow and it's affected by unnaturally cold weather or um, unnaturally wet fall, like goldenrod, for instance, this year was good around here for goldenrod. In some areas, it wasn't good. So the bees were able to bring in uh, some goldenrod. But, uh, you know, checking the hive's weight is another key component to having a healthy hive. Um, you know, I'm not going to throw out a number as far as the weight of the colony. I, well, I, I do know some beekeepers uh, that, that say that a single box hive should be roughly 90 pounds going into a heavy winter like we have up here. Maybe down south, maybe a little less. You know, I can't answer that for you. You're going to have to make that your own determination for your own bees. But one thing I did learn and I have learned over the past four years is at the timing at which I take my honey off. I've always, when I first started, I was always more greedy about it than anything. It's like, well, they're still, make, they're still bringing in honey, so I want them to store it so I can have more honey. Uh, so I was taking it off in late 
late August, um, which I probably shouldn't have. What I probably should have been doing was pulling off the honey in, let's say, um, the end of July or just at the beginning of August. I pull out all my hives. And let's say that there's still a bit of honey flow left where it's not just a maintained honey flow where, you know, the bees can consume it you know, consume it at the same rate that they bring it in. I'm talking about they can bring in a surplus and store it in their brood nest. Um, you know, that's what you, you, you want the bees to be able to store away enough honey on their own so you don't have to feed. And like I said, I've been, I've been a little greedy in that account and I'm going to correct that for myself this year. So I'm always learning about, uh, how I, uh, how I keep my bees and uh, you know sugar is cheaper than honey and this is true but I'd rather eat, not uh, feed them anything in the fall if I can help it uh, you know I, I feed them sugar water in the fall and then you know by January um, they're running out and I've got to put more sugar on mountain camp or candy boards or whatever on to keep them from starving um, and, I, and, I, and that's an expense. I mean, it, it, you keep buying sugar and then next spring I'm going to have to feed them too. So now I'm, I'm buying three rounds of sugar uh, and that, <laughs> that gets very expensive. And if you didn't make a ton of honey off them to begin with, um, you're actually buying more in sugar than you are in, in, uh, than, you, than you made on, on the honey. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as to when you want to pull your honey uh, when your flows occur, uh, you know, you want them to be able to, to start back filling, you know, you don't want them to get plugged up because you want to be able to create that winter nest. Uh, another, uh, big issue and, and this is huge for me. And this is why I have reached out to network with beekeepers, uh, in the upper Midwest and that is develop a genetic strain of bees uh, that can adapt to your local region, area, climate, uh, honey flows, pollen flows, and winters. Um, if I'm buying bees that, you know, uh, are raised and overwintered down in Florida or Texas or California, those are uh, bees that are predisposed to uh, that climate. They are um, predisposed to uh, brooding up at certain periods of time in the, uh, you know, time of the year. Uh, they are predisposed to maybe brooding up later in the fall uh, and, 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 uh, and not shutting down when they should be, um, you know, building a winter nest. And they also might not be able to take advantage of certain uh, common honey flows for my region because they are building up for a point in time uh, for when honey flows might occur down south. Uh, and that's not good for us here. If I have, you know, a colony that uh, is raising brood into December and they start eating all the honey around, let's say that, let's say they're creating brood and it's really cold out. They can't leave that and they won't leave that brood. And then they've used up all the honey around that area. They won't leave that and they'll starve out. They'll actually literally starve out because they won't get off that brood to move three inches over to, you know, to go get that honey. And uh, so you want to create a, um, a strain of bees for your own local use. Uh, networking with other beekeepers in your region is uh, a key component. Trying to get... Um, bees uh, or or queens 
from other beekeepers in your region is key. Now you can't, you know, most of us hobbyists, we can't self-sustain our own um, genetics, strain of genetics without getting inbred. So we're always going to have to bring in uh, bees from the outside. So that's why it's really good to network with uh, other beekeepers that are doing that want and do the same. Uh, you know, maybe maybe trade this guy four queens for your four queens. You know, but we all and I understand for the most part that we've all got to get started somewhere. We've got to get our bees from somewhere, and you know, any way you slice it, we 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 have to depend on uh, bees from the south to get the start because honestly, they they uh, get their splits way earlier than we do. And we want to hit the ground running when May, May rolls around. So you got to get your start somewhere. So if you're a brand new beekeeper, you really, you really don't have any choice. Up here, you know, we can't start selling uh, nukes because even our overwinter nukes are going to take a while if we're going to sell half. Let's say we try to sell half of our overwinter nukes that make it. Um, you know, they lost population all, all winter long. So it's going to take them a while till the dandelion really gets rolling in uh, in mid to late May before they start really brooding up, and you got a pack, you got a nice box of bees to sell somebody. So now that new beekeeper is buying a nuke, you know, June first instead of uh, uh, May first, and then he's really trying to get you know because everybody wants to get honey, right? Uh, he, he just, you know, you get a June 1st, that colony is not going to be able to build up to produce you really any honey. And that's why they tell a lot of beekeepers don't take any honey from your hives the first year. You want to leave them everything that they got. Uh, but if you can get a colony from down south, you bring it up here, uh, you can start May 1st and you can get, you can get honey off of it. I mean, I caught a swarm on what, June 20th? Huge swarm. And uh, I probably made 60, 60 or 70 pounds of honey off of that one colony. But it was a huge, I mean, it's probably 10 pounds of bees. It was, it was enormous. Uh, so I got a kind of a, a, a jump on things there. Uh, but creating your own um, strain of bees is critical to uh, surviving. You know, you watch videos out there of these beekeepers that are really successful at wintering their bees. Um, good hives, healthy hives, um, and you know, they overwinter really well. And one of the things that, that might be missed when you watch that video is, is that these beekeepers are, have their own, essentially their own strain of bees. Uh, they might bring in, like I said, from, from others uh, in the north, but they're not buying packages from Georgia or Florida or Texas uh, every year and expecting a 100% survival rate. They are, they are creating their own queens, they are overwintering winning nukes, and they have a system that, is, uh, that they have perfected over time. There's always going to be ebbs and flows in beekeeping. Nobody is perfect. And uh, only a, a lot of the good YouTubers will essentially tell you that, that nobody is perfect. A lot of good systems out there, but you know, you've got to develop a system that works for you. And again, that's why I try not to tell you to do what I'm doing uh, to all your bees. You know, maybe uh, do what I do on a very, very small scale to see if it works in your apiary. I love networking with other beekeepers. Um, that's why I got on YouTube, number one. Uh, number one, I, I wanted to share with other beekeepers, you know, my uh, trials and tribulations and successes, but I also want to learn from other beekeepers, and that's really the only way. I mean, I started out watching YouTube videos, and I learned who not to watch and who to watch. It took me a while to figure out who I could trust and who was just selling me a whole lot of bullshit. Uh, and I'm not gonna sit here and name names about them, but I really trust guys like uh, Michael Palmer. Um, you know, they, they are guys that, that just got out and did it. Uh, and they, they failed and succeeded 
Ian Stepler, you know, although he's commercial, you can get you can get a lot of good information, and he does what works for him, and he doesn't do what works for other people, uh, because he's tried it and it doesn't work where he's at, but it does work for him, and that's another thing that you got to take with it too. I I don't have a shed uh, to put my bees in, so I gotta take what he gives me and only apply it to how I keep my own bees. Uh, you know, uh, Cayman Reynolds down in Tennessee, really good beekeeper, very honest man, uh, but a, but he's in Kentucky, and a lot of the climate and conditions and things for him aren't going to work for me here, and, and essentially vice versa. Uh, so I have to pick and choose what I take from, from him and his videos, and only apply it what can work for me here. Uh, you know, pollen patties is a big sense of contention on some people. You know, there's beekeepers out there telling you to feed feed pollen all year all year round. Well, they're in Georgia. They their bees can get out and do cleansing flights. And and let's get back to this. Uh, you know, creating your own strain of bees. Um, I had a hive last year that. Was it, I actually caught it from a swarm. And uh, big hive, huge, healthy. I put apivar strips in the fall, fed it. It was very, very, it was fed very well. Um, in January, I put the candy board on it. Uh, didn't take them long, they were up there. The, the, the uh, cluster was uh, seven bees wide when I checked it in January. And every day I would come out and it would, uh, they would be leaking bees. Uh, 50 bees would be out in the snow, and you know, even at 10 below, there were bees out committing suicide. And I mentioned this earlier. And I, I in my mind, I'm trying to figure out, well, you, like I said, you know, you know, bees die every day, and it's just gonna happen. But what I've come to realize is those bees, that those winter bees there, they had an illness, a sickness, and those bees out there committing suicide were doing that for a reason. They were getting away from the hive because they were sick, and the only thing that I could come up with is, uh, is that they had a varroa problem, uh, and the apivar strips didn't take care of it because the apivar strips were put on too late. I didn't take care of the varroa, uh, fast enough before they created their winter nest. Um, so uh, the, bee, the hive leaked bees and by the time late spring rolled around that eight frames of bees in January was down to a frame and a half of bees, maybe two frames of bees with the queen. Um, and I spent the next I don't know, month and a half trying to nurse that colony. And I, I, I swapped positions with the colony and, and gave it, got it, so it got it more population. And the queen started laying more, and all of a sudden I had chalk brood issue, major chalk brood issue with it. And what I really should have done right then and there was cut my losses and just requeened it. And that is. You know, there might have been something wrong, you know, with the queen. It was just a, she was she was a poor queen at the end. Um, but I, I kept trying to uh, limp it through, and then I ended up splitting uh, her out of there. I put her uh, into a, a, a nuke and seeing if that that would get it. I finally did requeen that colony, and that's actually the colony like I said, to my far right with the yellow on it. And uh, uh, I put her in a nuke, and uh, that nuke still had uh, spotty brood, chalk brood, uh, all the issues. And finally, I, I finally just gave up, and I, I sent her packing. Uh, but it took me, I just, I, I, I got this thing in my head where I want to give it every chance in the world, and I just shouldn't have wasted all the resources that I did trying to care for this colony. Um, but now, you know, 
uh, I'm trying to limp that colony through. Is that a colony I really want to have um, as part of my genetic profile? Uh, weak, uh, weak colony, one that can't survive, one that goes through its stores. Um, should I have cut my losses way, way earlier? Absolutely, I should have. Bees are such an expense, and I'm not the world's richest man. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of dirt poor, but uh, <laughs> regardless, um, I hate giving up on the colonies, and I'm not going to give up on every colony in the world out there that's just weak. Uh, you know, sometimes there's just, you know, due to maybe some moisture issues. I had another hive that had moisture issues, but I got three frames of, or two frames of bees through and took a while, but that frame, that, that queen actually started really laying. I gave it some bees and I gave it, and she just went to town and it produced me probably 40 pounds of honey, 50 pounds of honey this year. Uh, so she ended up being a, a fantastic girl. That's a queen that actually I really want to um, have the genetics of. That's one I don't want to have the genetics of. Um, you know, I, I will try to limp as many as I can through winter, uh, but if a colony comes into fall and it's, you know, you know, you sit there and you compare it to other hives and you're giving them the same amount of sugar and it's like, well, why isn't that colony, you know, it's got the same number of bees, but it's not taking in any, it's not really working very hard. It's not taking in much uh, for nectar. Even if I give it nectar, it's not really working hard uh, to do that. It might be from a strain of bees that, you know, it's not used to maybe pulling down that kind of nectar and getting ramped up. Uh, to do that that time of the year to get ready for for winter. So is that something that I really want in my apiary? Uh, you know, by by uh, uh, December, oh, mid December, I went and checked it. It was dead. It had starved out. I had given it food, uh, syrup this winter or this fall, and it didn't take it down, and it ended up starving out. And I, and it sucks to lose bees, but I was okay with it because that's not a colony that I want. Um, that's not any genetics that I want to have if I start my queen rearing program. I uh, got a little bit behind the eight ball last year and didn't get the queen rearing program that I wanted to get. This year is going to be a little bit different. Um, as far as that's concerned, I don't have that same job that just takes me away from uh, caring for my bees as much as I had. Uh, uh, another couple of reasons as to why you might have lost bees uh, in the winter. Um, proper ventilation in your hive is a big, big, big issue. Um, I don't care if you use a quilt board or, or what you use on top. Uh, you want to have the vent, venting in the bottom, at least around here, and exhausting out the top. Uh, that exhausts out the moisture from the hive and uh, and it'll keep your hive a little bit healthier. Uh, this year I'm experimenting again. I'm leaving all my hive bottoms wide open rather than uh, just a queen excluder. And I'll tell you why. Last year I had uh, queen excluders on all my, all my big hives. And what happened was as the bees died due to attrition over the winter, you know, bees pile up. Well, they piled up enough to where they piled up actually at the bottom and they essentially blocked, they essentially blocked the entrance. And as the bees, you know, decompose, it's still warm in the hive. Uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little damp. Moisture started, I, the bottom didn't vent anymore. So moisture started building up in the hive and then the bees started dying in droves uh, in those colonies. And I lost a couple of colonies because the bottom vent got blocked with bees. So this year I went with completely open uh, bottoms and I, I just used a uh, uh, number four hardware cloth uh, and bent in a V and I've got a video on that. And I shoved that into the bottoms of those hives just as a, as a uh, mouse excluder, I guess, as you will. Uh, bees can come and go, but 
if the bees pile up in one certain area, there's still plenty of room for the bees to vent. Now, on my, some of my hives, um, some of my nucleus colonies, um, not that one, but um, actually, they're over, over there. Uh, they only have a, uh, a three-quarter inch hole in the bottom with a, a dial disc, actually, as their front entry. Hi, bud. So I have a three-quarter inch hole at the bottom of those nukes, and they can get clogged. So um, I've got uh, two upper entrances to hopefully um, add a little bit more venting. I got one upper entrance, obviously, in the mountain camp rim, and I've got one upper entrance just in the box itself and hopefully that uh, will keep enough venting in the box so that uh, even though the bees uh, pile up at the bottom um, it's not going to cause that moisture issue um, you know I'm not I'm not you know going to be out here at, let, let, let's say out at my farm apiary I can't even drive out to the farm uh, because there's snow piled up in front of the entrance anymore uh, so I can't, I'm not going to be getting out there and cleaning out, uh, you know, lower entrances or anything like that. Pretty much the bees are on their own. I gave them their mountain camp, you know, as best I could. Uh, you know, I tried to get them up to weight as best I could. They are essentially on their own. Now, if we get a nice warm spell in early March, uh, I'll go out there. And, and uh, if I need to go put uh, a sugar brick on them, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And... Uh, you know, I, I got this mountain camp on them, and, but I've also made up these, and, and all this is is a little, it's, well, it's not Tupperware, it's rubber made. Uh, they're about, oh, two inches, maybe, well, no, about an inch and a quarter high, and I just packed sugar in them, sugar and, and, and a little water, and I'm making sugar bricks, and these are essentially a mold, and I just, uh, you know, invert that. This will just become a sugar brick. And, and then, you know, I, I realize that I have sugar camp on there now, but as they go through that, I can just take this brick out and set it in my hive and, uh, and give them a, a little boost maybe in March uh, to, to get over that little hump uh, as to maybe when they, uh, you know, get through April and uh, when the maples start uh, producing a little bit of nectar and and a little bit of um, pollen being brought in i'm also going to be making up some pollen substitute to put on my hives uh, and i'll probably put that on depending on the weather probably the third week of april when our maples start blooming here so or just about a week before our maples started blooming but uh that's it um uh, you can see them coming out of the 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 uh entrance there that one just came out she she flew around a bit she went right back in um, i've all i've already gone through this but i i uh i also put you know two inches of foam on top of my uh inner covers and i do that to keep the condensation uh from building up in the hive uh especially up here you know down 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 in uh southern uh, even southern Wisconsin or whatever, you could probably get away with, you know, an inch. Uh, but up here, I need that two inches uh, to get to keep that condensation off the lid. Um, that can also hurt your bees. Uh, but good ventilation. Like I said, I got, you know, there's a vent hole here for my inner cover. I've got this vent hole, and then I've got the lower vent. And I got that on actually on all my hives. Uh, you can see the back there, it's the lower entrance. I got the, the middle hole and then I've got the upper hole. So hopefully that'll do it. Um, if you got any questions or comments, leave them below. Uh, I, I do have a Facebook page uh, if you want to follow me there. And answer, I'll answer any questions that you got there. It's just, just look it up. It's Bear Creek Honey. I'll try to put a link below in the, in the show notes. And uh, you can follow me there, ask me any questions that you want. You can message me if you want to make it private. 
Uh, sometimes it's a lot easier for people to comment on Facebook than it is uh, on YouTube. So uh, I hope it helps out uh, you as to uh, you know how I winter my bees and, and why my bees might die. Uh, I'm always I'm always always uh, trying to um, experiment to find out the best way. Oop, there goes a little girl there flying around. Uh, one one of the other things that I uh, I experiment with in the winter time is my hive configurations. And honestly, I think I'm gonna go with the single brood box. I think that that's my best bet. Um, now I have a two frame feeder in, in mine uh, that takes up two of my 10 frames. Uh, so I got eight frames in there, but I think that that's probably gonna be my best configuration. If you can see the one next to it has a box and a half. Uh, the thing I don't like about the box and a half is in the, in the springtime, all the bees will be up at the top and that's where the queen will start laying. And then I have a bugger of a time getting her down because I can't, she'll have brood up top and there might not be a ton of bees in the colony and I can't really shake her, shake them down into the lower box, put a queen excluder down uh, because it gets cold at night. So if all the bees are up taken care of uh, that brood up top, there ain't gonna be enough bees down in the lower box to uh, help that queen, um, you know, cover up all the queen and all the eggs and brood that, that she's gonna be starting to lay. So you're gonna lose brood in that thing. So I don't really like my queens laying in my honey supers. So I think I'm gonna stop that practice after this year. I had success, uh, you know, it was extra honey that I had um, and the bees seemed to do well on it, but I just don't think that that's, uh, that's the way to, uh, to hive my bees in, in my successes. So I think I'm just gonna go with a single brood box. They seem to be able to survive the winter in that case, in that configuration, uh, just fine. As long as, like, like I said, other conditions are met. You know, the box was full of honey to begin with. Uh, I've taken care of the, uh, uh, the mites before they created their, uh, the winter bees. Uh, and the genetics of that uh, specific colony can survive a winter. And uh, if they can't, well, that doesn't do me a whole lot of good. You know, like I said, buying bees from the south is not the way to do it. Uh, creating your own northern hardy bees or bees that are work for your region. I've got a friend that lives in uh, southern Michigan and his climate is completely different than mine. And I'm not so sure that, that his bees or, you know, could survive here, nor my bees survive uh, down by him. Uh, he's got different, he's even got different honey flows and, uh, and just different weather. And, and you know, his bees are out, his, his bees were out, you know, a couple weeks ago out flying around and foraging. It was really crazy. Uh, so again, your region, building a, a, a genetic base for your region, trading with other local beekeepers, that can just do nothing but benefit everyone. And don't forget, networking with other people is, uh, with other beekeepers is the way to go. So, till next time, happy beekeeping.